troublesome detail. Matthew paced between one mint green wall and the other. The lino squeaked. The air smelt of rubbing alcohol and unclean socks. His mind was a muddle. Please wait, someone had said, minutes ago. Or was it hours? And how was it he had got here? He must have driven. But Rowan had the car, so he couldn't. Bus? Train? Taxi? Surely he'd remember. The police car. He nodded. It must have been that. Though he couldn't for the life of him remember any of the details. Couldn't recall the cramped space. The non give of the seat. And his plastic field surface. Failed to recover the sound of voices. The crackle of the police radio. And the flashback images of the rain drenched streets. Think, Matthew, think. His hand raked through his hair and he could smell something on his fingertips. Garrick. Yes, of course. Through the haze, certain images were clear. The steamy blast from the oven where his cockle band was simmering nicely. The steamy blast there from the oven and the full buried taste of the marrow. Not the cheap stuff from the recipe, but the pricier bottle he'd opened to let breathe and had poured himself just half a glass of. The doorbell ringing. He smiled. Good. Rowan back from her day out with Joanna. She must have forgotten again to take her keys. He cradled the glass in his palm as he walked to the door and opened it. Red splashed across the choir carpet. And then he paused by the water cooler and twisted the nozzle to fill a cone-shaped cup. The water was teeth-tinglingly cold, and he crushed the cardboard in his fist. His mind was foggy, but one thing was needle-sharp and plain. His being here was a dreadful mistake, and the sooner he could establish that, the better. The door creaked open. The woman was dressed in a nurse's blue tunic. Her eyebrows were pulled together anxiously. Matthew Summers, she said. His throat felt raw, which was odd, because he'd had a quiet day on his own, not talk, talk, talking the way Rowan and Joanna would have done. It was safest just to nod. Her lips pressed tight. I'm so sorry. Would you like to come this way? He didn't want to go with her, but on the other hand, it was the only way to sort this mix up out. Their footsteps echoed along the corridor. He felt impatient to get where they were going, yet his legs were heavy and sluggish, like in one of those nightmares where the more urgent something is, the less you seem capable of shifting. The nurse's steps slowed and stopped. Her lips opened and closed, but nothing reached his underwater ears. She opened the door onto a small room, a bed in the centre surrounded by a paraphernalia of monitors and equipment. A woman lay beneath the glare of harsh lighting, one cheek swollen, her eyes closed, a yellow cover pulled up to her chin. Just take your time, the nurse said, her hand touching his arm. He shook her off like a, a pesky fly and stepped forward. The world blurred and spun. Then everything snapped back into focus. He realized two things simultaneously. One, the woman was dead. Two, this wasn't Rowan. Elation flooded through. Of course this wasn't Rowan. He'd known all along there'd been some sort of confusion, and now he understood the cause. People made this kind of mistake all the time. <coughs> the woman lying there, so pallid and inert, could not be Rowan. It was Joanna. Joanna had always been the quieter of the two, a pale reflection. Rowan shone with energy and life. He remembered meeting her, a chance encounter at an art gallery, the exhibition she intended going to with Joanna, only Joanna didn't show. It felt like fate had intervened on this occasion. He'd never have dared approach the two of them with his cheesy chat-up line. This bloodless figure, 
was not the vibrant woman he knew and loved. He ought to tell someone, the, the nurse, the police. The policeman who had been at his house just minutes ago, or was it hours, had been adamant that Rowan was dead. They talked on and on about the freak falling of a tree and proved fatal to the car that happened to be passing underneath. They sounded so certain with all their facts. It had been an effort just to, to nod and act as if they were making sense. He continued staring at the body. Guilt jabbed at the headlines of his relief. After all, he'd grown fond of Joanna. A requisite of loving Rowan was feeling affection for her identical twin. Not that they were identical, not literally. Monozygotic was the term Rowan loved to use. A single zygote splitting apart. God playing dice. A one in 300 happening in which one became two. A pair of genetically identical yet very distinct individuals. He himself had always known, instantly, who was who he never mixed them up. Well, only once or twice. Only when he was drunk. Or the lighting down, neither of which was there case here. He'd have to point out the details to the nurse, how there were subtle differences in bone structure. Even through the cuts and the bruising, it was quite, quite plain how the line of the cheekbones was less sharp, less sharp than Rowan's. Joanna's face was less distinctive, less beautiful. Rowan always laughed when he said this, told him not to be so daft. He glanced over his shoulder, but he was quite alone now. His pulse of elation ebbed as grief for Joanna began to work its way in. Worse than his own sorrow would be the ricochet of Rowan's. Rowan would be inconsolable, and there'd be so little he could do to ease her pain. He thought of the gap-toothed seven-year-old daughter Joanna was leaving behind, a husband too. He could hear heels clipping along the corridor, the rhythm of Rowan's walk, and the muffled sound of that nurse's voice. Rowan must have been contacted somehow and told. The door behind him opened. He felt the faint breeze, could smell the scent of Rowan's perfume, and hear her heart-stopping cry, No! Her expression would be terrible, and he couldn't bear to turn and look. Couldn't bear, not yet, to confirm what he knew so absolutely. That it was Joanna lying dead and Rowan grasping his arm in a vice-like hold. He remembered how police had said that the dead woman was driving his and Rowan's car. Which was odd, he thought given how Joanna had never learned to drive. 